Hello, I'm Jonathan Bowman Perks, and welcome back to my favorite time of the week. And as part of the Inspiring Leadership series, I'm very, very lucky to have Layla Woodington. And Layla is the uh, marketing director for Northern Europe for Facebook. Very interesting uh, career that she's had. She's been about nine years at Facebook, and before that, she was at PayPal. And it's just lovely uh, being able to talk about leadership and different experiences. Layla also um, like myself and my wife, Lee, is involved in the Marketing Academy. And she was recommended by Philippa Snare, who's now at Trading Desk as the Senior Vice President for EMEA. And also, Layla was recommended and was successfully put forward for the, one of the leadership awards at the Inspiring Leadership Trust Charity Gala. And uh, does an awful lot for other people in mentoring and helping bringing people on. Layla, great to have you on the series. Thank you so much for having me, Jonathan. It's lovely to be here. Great. And tell us a bit about the, um, the role in Northern Europe uh, in marketing at Facebook. It's a fascinating brand. Uh, tell us a bit about the, the current role and then we'll talk on about, about leadership and your journey. Sure. So my team um, covers the UK and the Nordics um, and we look after all of our B2B um, marketing. So essentially our, our role is to try and help advertisers and brands um, understand how best to use Facebook's family of apps and services to, to drive their businesses forward. And that's, you know, right across Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, our messaging services and so on. So that's kind of what we do in a nutshell. Great. OK. And inspiring leadership, you know, who, who have you learned from? I think you and I were chatting before. There were about sort of three inspiring leaders that you mentioned, uh, one of whom I know, but I'd love you to talk about all three and the sort of qualities that each of them um, inspires in you and other people. So, so who are your three? Yeah, I've, I've, as I mentioned to you when we were chatting, I've, I've had the privilege of having two sort of direct um, managers who've been incredibly inspiring leaders, one of whom is Philippa, as you mentioned, um, another is the lady called Anita Lou Harvey, who I worked with at PayPal, um, who went to Barclays and is now at Spotify. And then the other person I'd mention is um, a lady called Nicola Mendelssohn, who runs our EMEA operations. Um, she's the VP of Facebook in EMEA. Um, and she's uh, an incredible leader in, in every aspect. Yeah, so let's, um, let's go through each in turn. So Philippa Snare, um, yes. what, you, know, you, you talked about her being quite, you know, it's nice when people break the mold, do things differently. There is no one great leader image, you know, we're all very human with our faults and things, but what is it that makes Philippa such an inspiring leader for you? I actually think it's a similar trait for all three, even though they're very different, but it's um, the, the level of authenticity they bring. Um, you know, Philippa, thinking about her specifically, um, she was incredibly direct, super transparent, great humor. And I think all of those things in a, in a high pressured, very complex environment, um, I, I personally found valuable and, and inspiring. Mm. And as you said, she you know, isn't a typical sort of leader that you draw on paper. And I love that about her. Mm, yeah, no, and it's great that she's gonna be on the, on the series as well. So we look forward to interviewing her later. Mm -hmm. So tell us about um, the other two and what specifically you, you appreciated about uh, Anita and then Nicola. Anita, again, a common trait would be her authenticity and sort of the, the way she led was very different to many of the other leaders at, at PayPal at the time. Um, and she, she had this amazing way of sort of recognising the team's strengths and creating space for each person to, to grow and develop and just giving the right amount of sort of pushing to, to help people develop. And that was something that I, you know, sort of wanted to take away from her as a leader of spending time on that. Yeah, and, and just picking that one up, uh, time yeah. and again, good leaders uh, like Anita learn people's strengths and their vulnerabilities. Yes. And, they, and they reinforce their strengths and yeah. they protect their vulnerabilities. Not to ignore them, yes. but they just look after them and know that's not the right area for them to do until they're ready or they've grown into it or give them an opportunity to grow and develop and overcome something that they're anxious about, whether it be public speaking or something like that. Yeah, Absolutely. I think that's, that's a really good point you raised about Anita. And what about Nicola? Yeah, I mean, Nicola, you know, first of all, just her list of accomplishments you know, at Facebook and before is, is incredible. She's the first female president of the 
IPA and, and had a, has had an incredible career. But again, she um, the way she leads is so authentic, so open, so transparent. Um, she had a personal illness recently and the way she shared that with everybody and, and shared the, the journey that she went through, I think was incredibly inspiring. Um, and again, you know, she's the most senior person in EMEA, but her door's always open. She she looks for strengths and opportunities for people to shine and she's very empowering and trusting and sort of lets various people around the business step up and get on with things, which I think is incredible. Fantastic. And, and we didn't discuss this before, but I'm just interested about teams because, mm. um, you know, it's not about the great woman or the great man. It, it's often the incomplete leader with a complete team. When, when you've been in really good teams, particularly in a crisis, like here we are in COVID-19, but it's timeless beyond that. But what have you found about good teams that you've been part of? And, and, and what qualities does the whole team bring that comes from the sum of the parts? I think one thing I'd go back to is the sort of start of the conversation about strengths. I think um, a team that's quite self-aware and recognises who's good at what and, and you know where perhaps your strengths don't lie, that is incredibly important when you're in a tough sort of crisis situation because people can step forward into the areas where they know they can have impact and actually recognise where somebody else is better placed to do something. So the cohesiveness of the team there I think is, is really important um, and, and transparency again when you've got things that are moving at speed pressurized um, people being able to communicate effectively especially when you're at home for example you know you're not even in the office to, to, to see each other in normal circumstances um, it's always important but those are sort of the two things I think I've seen are absolutely critical yeah and and in a moment i'll ask you about mm -hmm. your experience of covid19 how you're coping with it what's going on for you yes. personally how you're working from home family and all that's happening for you in the future um mm -hmm. but you've you've reminded me um I, I very much enjoyed reading uh david marquet's book um leadership is language and yes. to add to your pile uh if you haven't already read it but i'm seeing some nodding so maybe you've read it already uh mm -hmm. and, and i do do like his comment about the part of this authenticity is saying when you don't know, I don't know. Yes. And actually, particularly in COVID-19, there's no playbook. People haven't done that one before. You don't know. And it's okay to say that. In fact, if you say, oh, I know what's going on and it's this and this, people don't believe you anyway. And Absolutely. it's not authentic. So when you say you don't know, it allows the team members to say that they don't know as well. And that lovely piece of when someone sometimes quite junior or from an unusual area, they go, actually, I know. But really, yes. well, come on, tell us what do we do? Well, it's this yep. great idea, love it. Let's build on that. Um, yeah. So, anything you want to say about that? And then let's talk a bit about your experience of COVID 19 uh, and the crisis and the impact on your the people you're dealing with, really, and your customers. Yeah, absolutely. So, I, I was nodding and sort of smiling when you were talking about that because um, I, I recently joined a, a round table with David and, and a few other leaders. Um, run by penguin and he talked about some of the things you know, that he covers in the book and and one of the things that just it's always been sort of a principle of mine but i think he articulated it so well was that leaders need to listen more and i think there is a tendency as you become more senior or as people become more senior that the sort of balance of conversation leaders speak more and other people speak less and that's just wrong on on so many accounts i think and he, he shared this example about um a submarine i can't remember the exact details that that sank almost inexplicably and that the crew was very experienced it wasn't a particularly unusual stretch of water and, and when they got hold of the black box recordings i'm cutting loads of it out in the interest of time but they analyzed volumes of, of speech and you know the captain spoke the most and it kind of just went in direct correlation with pay grade and they one of the things they learned was that the issue that had caused the ship to sink so to speak was something you know share of voice important. wasn't it share of voice absolutely yeah and if the share of voice had been different the person who could have or the people who could have raised that issue um were the exact ones who were speaking the less and had the, the least share of voice so i think that applies to many many crisis situations certainly i've seen that being very relevant um during the most recent times yeah and, and what else has been how how are you managing your um uh, one of one of my leaders talked it not working from home, but actually talked about the whole 
approach as remote first as an organization's choice to make remote working first choice so that everybody, even if you do decide to be in the office, you still join like this on a video call. Yeah. And, and I like that rather than talk about working from home, which still has negative connotation, someone skiving and they're, they're at home, they're not even really trying that this actually remote first is the way we're going to work. And maybe every, in his case, every couple of weeks, let's choose an open venue with lots of space and we'll all come and have a, almost like a, a, an offsite together, bring our laptops, chat with each other, do some face-to-face -face community, but you could even keep your meter distance if you choose a nice big hangar or whatever it is. So it's a safe place for people to come to. What's, yeah. what's your way of handling remote first and, and what's your learning uh, in Facebook at the moment in, in what's going on with the economy? I'd be interested generally your view. Yeah, I mean, we are, I would say, at Facebook incredibly privileged in the sense that, um, you know, our entire business is built on tools to help people connect. So we are very used to working remotely and working from home and working with people in different territories and time zones and, and whatever else. So I think um, adapting to working from home for us or, or, or sort of remote first, as, as you put it, um, was relatively easy compared to, to many other companies and we had all the tools and infrastructure to, to do so. Um, but, you know, kind of going to 100% of the time doing that for many people has been a challenge for a team that are close knit and um, have different, you know, some people of course have children at home, there's some people who live alone, so there's a different set of challenges that came for each individual. But um, one of the things I've noticed is that the team are actually closer um, because we've had to be so thoughtful about how we connect and make sure that we're talking to each other and you know being inclusive and, and checking in and all those kinds of things and also um, more efficient in some ways because you know an off-site that we might have done in person that would have taken two days we're now you know recognizing that no one can really sit in whatever their little workspace is at home for two days efficiently and we're leaning more on you know very solid pre-reads and um communication pre and then sort of different ways of having a discussion in a much more condensed stre stretch of time so there are things that we will take forward that i think um you know people talk about how do we get back to normal there are some many things that are, you know we don't want to get back to normal if that makes no. sense we want to retain the learnings no, it, it, we, we mustn't go back we've got yeah. to go forward yeah. and um you touched on something which is very important to all of us, which is this thing about inclusivity and everyone having an equal share of time and voice and innovation okay. and ideas, and that we do need divergent thinking. Again, it was the thing David Marquet talked about, that, the, that, that uh, a lovely system he has, fist to five. So how ready are we to launch this particular product? Yeah. Um, fist means no, not ready at all. Five, completely ready. And then you ask, the lowest scoring ones who have yes. the most divergent views. What are their views? So vote first. Yeah. Whereas most people have long discussions and then they vote at the end where you've, you've obviously converged most ideas and the, the, the naysayers and the ones who are worried go quiet and say, no, it's yeah. okay. Absolutely. Uh, and the decision maker and the decision evaluator is the same person, the most senior person, uh, hippo, the highest paid person's opinion. And, and yeah. so people don't call out. But in this idea of inclusivity and recognizing diversity of thinking and diversity of experiences and backgrounds. Um, your parents' background, you explained to me about that, that they came to study over here from Iran, and we yes. can talk about that later on. But how, how is, is the, the whole amazing initiative of Black Lives Matter, how, how is that impacting? And, and what's your own view on that and how to make the most of less talking, more listening, and, and more action? What's your, what's your view? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody has been significantly impacted by by what's going on and um, thinking through what they can do individually as teams and as companies. And I think for us at Facebook and myself personally, um, it's something we've been thinking a lot about anyway. And I mentioned a little bit when we were chatting, but we 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 launched some. We recognised about a year ago that you know we had this commitment to excellence in our work, but there was something sort of missing. Um, and we wanted to not only sort of make sure the output was excellent, but also the way we were doing it was, was excellent too. And 
recognizing that you know being at facebook we had a certain privilege and um influence um on the industry and, and thinking you know more deeply about how we could use that um to to drive inclusivity if you like and that man we sort of that came together in the form of a internal marketing manifesto which we launched which was 10 10 points um we tried to keep it simple that just gave people a structure of things that they should be thinking about and you know it had some things that are environmental and, and about sustainability and then about 60 percent of it was about diversity and inclusion and who we put on stages and perhaps more importantly who we get on stage with and how we can hold our partners to account just by nature of you know the, the influence we do have the suppliers that we work with and so we sort of started to tackle some of this stuff um through that and because of everything that's happened recently that has come right to the fore again and it's you know a, a huge focus for us to make sure that you know not only are we speaking up and posting black squares and all the, all the other things but we're actually taking very specific actions um to drive the conversation forward and and, and try and make a difference um, mm. through the work that we do and the relationships that we have excellent and, and, and in fact you've reminded me of um i was looking after work for uh, general the lord dannett when he was uh, my commanding officer and he felt that um, after some of the war fighting that was going on, that the servicemen were giving their lives for their country, but they weren't getting the deal back the other way. Mm. And so he set up the sort of, uh, you could call it a covenant between the country and the service personnel that look, you, you're going to go and give your lives and you may lose limbs and um, that, you know, the, the wives or the husbands who have serving wives, that they may lose their partners, but we will look after you with things like Help for Heroes and various institutions. And, and so it's a covenant between both sides. It's got to be reciprocated. And I think there's something like a covenant here that's needed between an organization and its employees, whatever their background, whatever their d diversity and their orientation, that they must be looked after in a fair and equal way. What, what's your thoughts? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with that. And I think, um, again, I, you know, I keep saying it, but Facebook, we're fortunate that these things are absolutely front and centre as part of the culture um, and have been, you know, before recent um, events. So there are different ways I think you can do that through training and, and making sure that people have access to information and learning opportunities to, to help them um, self-develop in these areas and become more aware to how you show up externally and kind of what you try and represent so yes yeah. absolutely agree with you yeah no great and and in many ways the culture of an organization the way things are done around here is what they call culture yeah. um, people tell stories and, and and the stories tell you how they treat people and and they sometimes can be bad stories in some toxic organizations yeah. which people go, there's no way I want to work in that organization if that's the way they do things. Um, uh, but I think that the whole storytelling is really important and also how leaders cope with failure and mistake and admitting when they get things wrong. Um, I, I often ask a leader, when was the last time you personally were dead wrong? And if they say to me, well, was it sort of 1984? Or, no, it's a bit hard. Actually, can't really think of occasion. That's a problem. But if they go, do you know what? I make frequently make mistakes, but I'm constantly learning from them and yeah. uh, quickly realizing and quickly aiming to admit it and rectify it. Um, yeah. You were telling me a story about a time when you, as a leader, personally got something wrong, but managed to, to um, learn from it and um, redress the problems that you had. Do you want to tell us a bit of a story? And uh, clearly, you to protect some of the things in there but just tell us a bit of a, a generic story yeah um and uh, before i actually get into that we as a leadership team sort of within the marketing organization we really have been thinking a lot about how to create safety around failure for the team and yeah psychological way, safety psychological safety absolutely isn't it? yeah and you know we want people to innovate and we want them to sort of do great work and if they're worried about failing we know that's a huge barrier so we introduced a thing called the F word, which is a monthly um, spotlight within our entire sort of EMEA when the whole team comes together once a month meeting and somebody gets up and shares an F up, something that they did that went horribly wrong, you know, talked about what the thing was, how they handled it at the time. And then, you know, I think crucially the, the learning. And 
it, interestingly, you know, it was pretty difficult at first to get people to volunteer to, mm -hmm. you know, air their dirty laundry. So we kind of risked at one point. I was like, look, this can't be the Layla show. I can't constantly be sharing <laughs> um, stories of my failure. But now it's just become part of how we work. And, you know, somebody else's mistake or failure is helping hundreds of other people from going down that path and it's making us better and more efficient. So that's kind of, um, I thought that was interesting where we've gone from sort of wanting to hide it to becoming much more um, open to, to sharing. But my and staying, staying with that for a moment, um, in her excellent book, um, and you, you're in part of a book club in Facebook and you read widely, um, I love a lot of the work of Margaret Heffernan and uh, Willful Blindness. And uh, she talked about a number of hospitals where they turned things around from people trying to cover up mistakes to actually getting people to, to almost do the F word and talk about their F ups. And, yeah. and um, uh, that it was good to, to actually share the mistakes that people made. And therefore, there were less deaths and um, yeah. problems because people were admitting early, as my old Sergeant Major said, sir, you know, if you've made a mistake early, I can help clean it up, put some antiseptic on it and a plaster. But if it's late in the day, yes. I might have to just recommend amputation because it's too late. You've, you know... Bad news does not get better with time, no, was what Jim Richardson, not. one of your predecessors on this series said. Bad news does not get better with time. Admit it early. Yeah. yeah. Couldn't, couldn't agree more with all of that. <laughs> okay. I, I do um, like, I'm, I'm going to take that, that, that F word. And, um, and do you do it every week? Is it a weekly thing? It's monthly. It's a monthly, monthly. thing. And yeah, monthly. we do, you do it daily. <laughs> we do special spotlights when there's other things to share. But yeah, it's kind of the... Yeah monthly meeting cadence um yeah yeah okay that's sorry, really great yeah sorry you, you were gonna answer, i was gonna say i didn't actually answer your question about um this, my failure story, i didn't yeah. really think i was i was dodging it because there are many <laughs> many occasions um but i guess one that i shared briefly with you earlier um there was a there was a marketing initiative that we were running just in the uk you know relatively small thing but um was extremely successful actually and we were very proud of it and basking in the glory of this thing that we'd launched that you know relatively small budget was doing exceptionally well and getting lots of attention and um turns out we just haven't taken a broad enough perspective to this piece of work thinking about the you know business in its entirety we we're just looking at kind of what we were doing um and it ended up in a in a cycle you know triggering a cycle of of, of bad press um for the company and you know global bad press which obviously is not what you want your marketing to, to do that's not the intention um and you know that's something we had to we had to work through we had to quickly recognize you know the the thing we'd done wrong which was not taking a broad enough perspective and acknowledge that and then look at the ways we could adapt the the, the project or initiative and and um sort of close that whole I guess and and then discuss with senior leadership how we could move forwards and I think the thing I took away from that was um accountability you know there the, it was not about looking for blame or who did what or who missed something it was about understanding the root of the issue and how to fix it mm. and having a clear sort of solution oriented way forward and the initiatives continued to run it was highly successful it became global and it actually you know continued to be a success story in the face of that so I think um how you respond in those moments is the thing that's absolutely critical and, and how you can move forward. Very good. So getting some success from the jaws of defeat, unlike others who get, uh, <coughs> they, they seize defeat from the jaws of victory. Um, and what about amusing stories in these difficult times when, you know, three or four months here we are in and um, you know, people are remote first working? Um, how, how do you lighten the load a bit and make things a bit more, a bit more fun? Yeah, I mean, I think people definitely look to their leaders um, and how they're behaving to, to um, understand how they can behave too. So if your leaders are very serious and all the time, um, I think that can rub off on the, the team and they can sort of feel they have to emulate that behavior. So, you know, when we first started um, remote working on a full-time basis and, People were pers on a personal level worried about the pandemic and, and how it was going to impact them and their families and also um, rewriting all of our marketing plans, of course, because, you know, we do a lot of stuff in person and that just wasn't possible. Um, 
it's a really simple thing, but I noticed towards the tail end of the day, people were very feeling very heavy under the load. You could tell even on a video conference. So um, I put a tiny reminder in people's calendars called four o'clock fun and just started sending something very lighthearted, you know, could be a video or a meme or something silly at four o'clock um, to the team. And just to, just to show them that it's okay to laugh and be light and, and you know, enjoy stuff together, even if we're in the midst of something incredibly stressful and intense. So that, that's just a small example, I think, of demonstrating. I think that's, I love it. Is okay. Four o'clock fun. <laughs> o'clock okay, fun. What, a, what about um, top tips? Give us a couple of top tips that uh, have served you well practically that you'd pass on to other people. I think, um, well, when we sort of talked about the, the, the listening, you know, more than you talk necessarily, uh, I think that's a really important one because um, it builds trust within the organisation. You hear your teams, you understand what's going on better. And I think it naturally mm. makes you a better leader. Um, maintaining perspective is another one. Um, we talked a little bit about that, but particularly in times like these, um, I think it's easy to get so lost in sort of the things that are difficult and hard. Um, but, you know, unless you are literally saving lives, um, an old colleague of mine used to always say it's, it's ER, um, the other way around, sorry, it's PR, not ER. And I always keep that at the back of my head and often share it with my team just to try and keep the perspective that, you know, yes, what we're doing is important and it really matters, but we are not performing heart surgery, you know, so try and retain that level of um yeah, very wise perspective um wise. No, that's good for now we'll, we'll save yeah. we'll save the one for later on and and then um really interested to know a bit about whatever you feel like sharing on your your upbringing and how it shaped you as the leader you are today and now uh the situation you're in now your family and yourself tell us a bit about you um so yeah well, whichever order you want to do but just um a little bit about how, how you've been shaped by your upbringing in your life. Sure. Um, so my, my parents, both uh, you mentioned uh, um, when we were talking, came over here from Iran many years ago to, to study, actually, um, and had always intended to go back, but then the revolution happened. So they ended up staying put and, and have been here ever since. Um, and they actually met in, in London working at the Iranian embassy. So my, my brother and I were both born here and, and we've been raised here all of our lives sort of in and around the suburbs of London and Surrey um, and I think one of the things when I think about what shaped me from my childhood is um, my dad you know my father's way of responding to certain situations and the example I'll give is um, he has a PhD in physics so you know he qualified and got his PhD in physics and did very well and then at that particular point in time there weren't that many jobs for people with PhDs in physics so he couldn't find the type of work that he needed and you know his baby on the way um, and he walked past um, a closed down bakery and he had some experience in Iran of making a certain type of bread and so he bought a bakery and started a bakery um, <laughs> And that was, you know, something he did. And it was quite successful for, for many years. Um, mm. And then he'd re retrained as a computer consultant and that sort of became his long-term career. But I think that ability to look for opportunities, try new things and, you know, not to be defeated is something that I've definitely taken from him. So that's mm. like a little bit about my, my family. Um, what about your mother? You, you mentioned your father, but what, what was your yes. mother's value set? And, and you know, you're, you're a uh, inspiring female leader. What, what did you learn from mum? You've got a brother and a father, yes. but what did you learn from your mother? Well, my mother um, worked when we were small and then has sort of stayed at home for, for many years um, after that. But I think the thing that I always took from her was, you know, actually she was the main breadwinner for a long period of time when we were very small. So it's never been our family's never sort of been one way or another. She's played her role in everything. And she just always used to say to me, have your own career and, you know, be dependent on yourself. And I think mm. that combined with this sort of openness and new opportunities are two absolutely critical things that have driven me. Um, mm. through my uh, career. I love the comment that you said, um, with a father who was a baker, your mother was the breadwinner. <laughs> yeah, I it. The, the yes, part, the part I didn't even spot that, yeah. <laughs> Okay, and, and um, 
Who else shaped you as you were growing up? So obviously uh, mother and father, but um, were you lucky enough to have some good teachers, some good mentors early on in your career? You know, tell me a bit about how you've developed into the inspiring leader you are today, not by your view, but by other people's views. You know, Philippa Snow recommended you uh, came onto this series. Yeah, so I think, you know, um, my, my career path has been pretty non-traditional, actually, and I can tell you a little bit about that. Um, and, you know, school was pretty normal for me, you know, uh, privately educated, but not having my eyes open to the breadth of opportunities around me, so having no idea what I wanted to do. So having a lovely education and some good teachers, but um, I think it gets more interesting when I left school and sort of um, deciding what I wanted to do. And I decided to study architecture just because I was interested in architecture vaguely. And through that, I discovered that I didn't want to be an architect, but it was you know, fine. I did the degree and then, um, you know, thinking about what to do next. And I saw an ad for um, Foxton's estate agents and I thought, OK, well, I know a lot about buildings and architecture and they pay actually really well at this point. I'll go and give that a try. I want to buy a property. So off I went and got a job at Foxton selling um, houses for a year or so, which, you know, seems bonkers to some people, but it was very formative in the, um, you, you know, you learn a lot about sort of communicating with people and selling ideas and, you know, um, psychology and things like that. And I bought a flat and then um, went and did a little bit of recruiting on a temporary basis because I thought, don't know what I want to do. If I work in recruitment for a while, I'll understand what's out there and then sort of recruited myself for the job at PayPal in that I emailed my boss who sat you know, 20 feet across this tiny office from me and said, I'd like to do that job, even though I have zero experience of it. But I really think I could I could do it. And here's why. And I you know, got the job there. And then, yeah, the rest has sort of been a, a combination of, of luck and great people around me. So mm. I've had people who've supported me throughout and said, you know, you should, you can do this, or would you like to give this a try? Um, and I've always been open to it. So yeah, from cool. selling houses to marketing. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and that really leads me nicely, a uh, nice segue on to uh, darkest moments and, and some of the highlights of your career in your life. Um, you described yourself as, um, you know, pretty optimistic, uh, always looking for, for, you know, find a silver lining to every cloud. Um, but, you know, we've, we've all had some dark moments. What have, what have been those themes of your dark moments and, and, and what have you learned from it that's made you more resilient and a more inspiring leader as a result of having been through that? Yeah, I think for me, the, the darker moments have always had a, a similar pattern in that there'll be things going on in my personal life that are, you know, intense and, and stressful like family members being ill or whatever it might be at that point and of course that shapes how you show up at work and I think once upon a time my reaction to it would have been to try and put a brave face on it and just sort of carry on business as usual but um, I've learned over the years that actually being more transparent and vulnerable and sharing a little bit more with my team and you know my, my peers about what's going on and how that's impacting me is much much better um, because otherwise, of course, you carry the risk of people will notice that you're behaving a little bit differently or you haven't got quite as much time for them and they'll invent their own story as to why that is. And I actually think that's far more damaging and risky than, you know, being demonstrating your vulnerability um, mm. personally. Mm. So that's kind of one thing yeah. I would share on that. Yeah. And, and, and what, what is your current family situation? Are you prepared to talk a little bit about your family now and what's happening in the yeah. future? Absolutely. Yeah. So I've been sort of locked down at home with my, my husband and five-year-old daughter with um, another baby on the way in about six, seven weeks. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah. So that's been an interesting few months, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's my let's should we just say my team are very familiar with my daughter who likes to you know the, the door being shut on my office was once an indicator that she shouldn't come in that she responded to but over a period of time it doesn't mean anything anymore so you're actually, you're actually, <laughs> we have, she hasn't busted in to say hello to you right matter, now it doesn't matter if she does and and i have my um 
Lee and I have uh, Lee's mum, who we care for 24 seven uh, for the last three years. And she's got Alzheimer's and various other illnesses. And at times I'm having this, and she'll wander in with some mail and have a chat with me and things like this. I go, I'll catch up with you in a minute, Marguerite. I'm just on, on air. But um, I think people these days, one of the lovely, there's many uh, positive sides to the, the desperate situation of um, the, pa the global pandemic and the economic depression that's come with it. But one is for people to be much more understanding of the whole mm. life that, that someone, a bit like the, the, the compass behind us, it's the integrated inspiring leader. Um, it's all parts of us from our health and our well being and our emotional intelligence and our resilience and our brand and the legacy we leave and our values. But yeah. our life isn't so detached anymore. The boundaries have blurred, yeah. which is, has its problems, but it has its upside in that we don't mind seeing a small child or in a couple of weeks' time, I'm going to have a I love a little puppy that Lee and I are getting to replace oh, one of our dogs that, that died uh, a, a year ago. And we, we miss not having the second dog. And um, that will be mayhem. It'll be like having a small baby. Um, but, um, uh, 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 you know, the responsibility is there for the next 14 years or so. And uh, it's not just for Christmas. So I think people seeing more of the, the human side to you and others, which is, which is good. What about the... Um, so, so some of the, the darker moments you talked about, what about some of the, the highlights and the, the proud moments in your life? What would you, what would you talk about there? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, personally, it would be the, the usual things, birth of child, wedding, all that kind of stuff, um, travels. But on a, on a professional side, um, there've been so many at Facebook, I have to say, you know, and that's why I've stayed there so long. There's consistently sort of these new highlights coming forward, but a couple that sprung to mind as I was thinking about this. Um, one is um, the, you know, potential legacy of the marketing manifesto and some of the things like that, that we've implemented within the team that will go beyond Facebook. You know, they impact the way people think and, and, and approach things. So I'm definitely proud of the work we've started to do there and we'll continue to do. Um, and then the second thing is, this might sound trite, but it's people. So I've hired lots of people while I've been at Facebook and seeing their journey and, and every single one actually is still at Facebook, whether you know on, on my team or on another team and the contractors that I've hired have found full-time positions at the company and sort of seeing their journeys and being able to bring in people into the business who then have successful careers, I think is something mm. I'll mm. always be, be proud of. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's a lot of story because your people are your really genuinely are your most important asset. They, without them, you're, you're nothing. And, and that leads us almost to the end of the, the, uh, this session in that um, perhaps your final tips and then uh, you love your reading, maybe a book that you'd recommend. And what are your future development plans um, as a leader? How are you going to keep growing and developing? I'll try and remember those. And I mean, I, some of these will be repetitive. Um, that's right, that's right. Sort of the, the thing about listening, maintaining perspective, I would repeat those. Transparency. Um, I think one I'd add is getting your hands dirty. Um, again, as you become more senior, you know, there's the ability to offload certain types of work always. But I think um, my style of leadership is certainly not sitting back and dictating to others what you want done from, from the back, but rather um leading by example um and sort of carrying my my share of the load and i think that in, it does seem to inspire positive behaviors in people mm. everyone feels like they're part of the the same thing so those would be a couple of very specific things that i'd mention mm. Mm. um and then i forgot and then your, de your development plans and what you're <laughs> reading a, a good book you'd recommend uh on, on leadership that you found useful yeah, so um, I'm, cu I'm currently reading two books. One is, funnily enough, The Language of Leadership after attending that um, round table, which I'm finding very interesting. Um, and I'm rereading Creativity Inc. by Ed Catmull, which I just think is such a brilliant book on, on leadership. And that's on this point about self-development. I think it's easy sometimes to become tunnel visioned and blinkered in your own industry and, and look at what you can learn from within technology or whatever but i find it fascinating to look at other industries and um take take lessons and learnings from from there so you know disney and pixar is just an incredible mm -hmm. story so i definitely recommend that to anyone who hasn't read it great 
Well, Leila, look, thank you very much. It's been fantastic having you on the series. You, you've um, brought a lot of experience, stories, some wisdom, and uh, just a, a real humanity and a humility about you, which um, makes you definitely justified to be in the Hall of Fame of the Inspire Leaders on this series. So thank you for your time and uh, much appreciated. Thank you so much for having me.